Welcome, Contemporary Math, to your first lecture. You've made it, you've found your way, and we are in Chapter 1A. Uh, this chapter is titled Living in the Media Age. Uh, and so they start off by throwing a few definitions at you. And so the first thing they want to talk about is this thing called logic. And so maybe before even reading it, like I want you to think maybe like what is logic? What when, when so someone says logic, what do you think about? What is the sort of thing that comes to your mind? And so there are a few ways in which we do use the word logic. Uh, here they're specifically referring to uh, the study of the methods and principles of reasoning. So when we talk about the area or the subject of logic, there is a subject of logic that we can study. Uh, people will also use logic to talk about the principles in the reasoning itself. So the, there are multiple ways in which we use the word logic uh, colloquially, right? Um, <clears throat> okay. And so the next thing we talk about is an argument, right? And so argument may have like some negative connotations sometimes, but I, when we talk about arguments, we're not really talking about anything with negative connotations. We're just talking about the structure in which you're presenting what you're saying, right? So an argument uses a set of facts or assumptions called premises to support a conclusion. So if we wanna create an argument, and this is like the stereotypical uh, cliche sort of, first thing and so if I want to talk about a premise let me talk about two premises and a conclusion <laughs> so this first thing says And you'll see two premises. That's what these P's are. And the C is the conclusion. So sometimes you'll see these three little dots that means like therefore, or maybe I'll draw like a line. There's a few things that they, they may or may not do. But we have these two premises. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, we can. Socrates is mortal. So this would be something like an argument that we would talk about. This is a deductive argument. So this is deductive reasoning or deductive logic. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more in, I believe like 1C, 1D, a little bit more about arguments and how to analyze them. Uh, and so I'm not maybe expecting you to soak this all up right now, um, but this is what a argument would look like. We have premises. If we put these two premises together, we can get this thing. This is a necessary, and this is a valid argument. And so this will always be sort of true, right? Um, I, I could do some weird things. Um, oh, all right. All men are feathered. All men are feathered. Reality, but it's still a valid argument, and so we'll talk more about validity and doing weird things like that a little later. <clears throat> but this conclusion is supported by my premises, right? And if I piece things together, like I piece things together linguistically here, these things are will always fit in the place, right? It's kind of like a puzzle or something, I don't know. Uh, there's a certain form to it, right? We'll get more at that form later and why it's valid, but it is valid and it, this conclusion is always supported by these premises. And so there's, there's a saying like a broke clock is always right like twice a day. So I could come up to a, let's, let's go back to real, right? So let's pretend like we're back in reality. So all men are mortal, Socrates is man. 
Therefore, Socrates, well, that's true, but it's not supported by my premises. And now we're getting at something here. This is like that saying I was getting at a broke clock is tw right twice a day. So our conclusion could be true, but it's not necessarily supported by our premises. Then it's not going to be a valid sort of argument. And so if we're thinking about things, <clears throat> Uh, if we want to get at valid arguments, first they're going to talk about a few things in which people get arguments wrong. So if fallacy is a deceptive argument, an argument in which the conclusion is not well supported by the premises. So it may be correct. It might be like this. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. And you might be drawing a conclusion Socrates is a philosopher. So your conclusion could be correct but it's not supported by what's happening here, right? There's nothing about the information given with men being mortal and Socrates being a man that would tell us that Socrates is a philosopher. <clears throat> so we want a conclusion that is supported by our premises, right? Or, you know, your conclusion could also be wrong and not supported by your premises. That's also another, uh, valid that's also another uh, let's not use the same words that's also another route that this could take right it's not supported by the solomon or mortal socrates is a man Socrates is, I don't know, done talking about him. <clears throat> so getting to fallacies and things that don't make sense, things that are not properly supported by their premises, right? And so this first one is the appeal. There's, I believe, yes, there are 10 sort of fallacies, common fallacies that we're going to talk about. Um, and so I want you to kind of be able to give come up with your own examples. Uh, if I give you an example, I want you to kind of know like where it's leading you, right? Um, with that said, these are fallacies. They're sort of things that we notice that people commonly do that are wrong <clears throat> when they draw up a conclusion. So it's not always definitive how these things are wrong. There are, I believe there are some overlaps and there are some ways that you can think about this, but I will try to make my examples clear and I will make try to make them clearly leading to one of these and as distinguished from the others, right? So hopefully I do that. But this first one is appeal to popularity majority. And so if you like live through the dare generation, uh, this is sort of like, I think they, sort of in line with the bandwagon approach, right? The fact that a large number of people believe or act some way is used as evidence that they believe or action is correct. So this is the one, the example that I have is Dunkin' Donuts is the best. Okay, so we're saying that Dunkin' Donuts has the best coffee because they sell the most coffee. And so the premise, so if I'm telling you Dunkin' Donuts has the best coffee, it, that it, more people buy Dunkin' Donuts coffee than any other coffee, what's my premise there? And what's my conclusion? So it might be best to like, you, you might think about the conclusion first. Like what am I saying? What's the down, down, downright statement that I'm making, right? The premise, why am I saying that?
Okay, so the next fallacy we have is the false cause fallacy. <clears throat> and this is the fact that like one event comes before another, you think that it's evidence that the second thing happened. And so, um, <laughs> Yeah, set it backwards. Every time I wash my car, it rains, right? Okay, so every time I wash my car, it rains. Therefore, if I wash my car, it's going to rain. Okay. And so this would be an example of like a false cause. I did something and something else occurred. I'm concluding that one of those things caused the other to occur. And so if I want to label my premise and I want to label my conclusion, what am I concluding? That's my conclusion, is that if I wash my car, it's going to rain. It's a silly conclusion because it's a fallacy. It's not supported by Maybe you live in Seattle or Florida or somewhere that like it's rain every day, right? Practically every day. Um, maybe you need to learn how to look at a forecast. I'm not sure. <laughs> that would be the conclusion. <clears throat> it's probably also an exaggerated statement. Also, it doesn't really say how long between them washing their car and it raining, same day or two days. Yeah. <clears throat> Could be multiple reasons. It is not supported well. Kind of like, I really like the blo bro broke clock example. <laughs> it's like they might be right the next time, but it's not guaranteed every time, right? It's not working. Same way that deductive Socrates is mortal sort of thing happening. All right. Example three, appeal to ignorance. Ignorance about the truth of proposition is used to conclude the opposite. Okay. So this would be like, uh, my example is that since there's no records of Frank checking out a book, then he must have not taken the book from the library. Okay, so since no record of book withdrawal, then he didn't take the book. <clears throat> so I think it might be easier to start thinking about the conclusion. What are we saying? What is like the definitive thing that we're concluding? That he did not take the book. Why do we think that he didn't take the book? Record of it, right? <clears throat> And I'm hoping like every time I just like say one of these things, you're just kind of laughing maybe to yourself inside, maybe not loud, but like just a little, little, little giggle. And just, you're just like thinking, well, that's kind of stupid, right? Uh, since, since there's no record of the book withdrawal, there's a lot of things that could be going wrong with these conclusions, right? Like these are not well supported by what is happening here. And then he could have snuck the book out, could have stole the book. He could have, the record could have gotten deleted. 
The machines might be finally fighting back. We've gone too far. They said enough is enough. Okay. <laughs> Example four, hasty generalization. Uh, so this is a conclusion is drawn from an inadequate number of case, cases or case. Uh, or cases that have not been sufficiently analyzed. Okay, so. <clears throat> I don't know what, what new gimmick they have, but <laughs> my example is that two of my friends swear that the purple pill they saw at the gas station gives them energy and makes them feel healthy. Therefore, I'm concluding the pills must be good and healthy for you to take for more energy. So your friends take a purple pill and they feel good. Therefore, you're concluding, yeah, the pill's good for you. <clears throat> and that's really sort of the thing. I'm trying to draw, like, by putting this word too, right? I'm trying to draw attention to, like, there's a really, really small number of people that are telling you this. So when we do like trials on drugs and things like that, we typically do a lot larger than just two people. I think there's usually hundreds, you know, of subjects before they usually release it to the general public. So you want a pretty substantial number uh, before you start drawing conclusions on things, right? And if we go to premise conclusion, I have two friends that said it's good. I'm concluding, therefore, it's good, right? Not a large sample size. That's kind of like the, the, the basis of this hasty generalization is that we have a really, really small sample size is what we call it. <clears throat> and that's basically the, the people that we're referencing and like I said, if we do a clinical trial, we're going to have more people taking this before they would release it. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> that is what hasty generalization. Now we're on to number five. And example five talks about limited choice cross dilemma. Uh, and so, to, it artificially precludes options that ought to be considered, is what it says. And I think it's from the book, so probably not the best introduction. But this is also known if it's two options. This might be known as a FOSS dichotomy. And so if they're only giving you two options, that would be like a FOSS dichotomy. Um, and so one of them says, if you don't vote Democrat, then you have to vote Republican. Uh, so these, are, these problems probably aged really well from when I first wrote them. <laughs> And if I make an if then statement, there is a sort of form. These are going to be in, right? A premise would be the same. Conclusion. If you're not going to vote dim, would, so not voting dim would be your premise. The conclusion that you're going to draw is that you're voting Republican, right?
And a little bit about like maybe the problem behind this is that like there's there's other options between voting, right? You could not vote, you could vote third party, there are other options. <clears throat> it is not an either or, you're not forced to vote for one or the other, right? Okay. And that's what they mean by it precludes other options. You're you're forcing people to choose between two things, or maybe you're forcing people to choose between three things, and there's other things out there, right? You're, you're narrowing it down to a limited choice. <laughs> and there may be more things out there. Uh, there's an appeal to emotion, and this is an attempt to invoke an emotional response as a tool of persuasion. Okay. So there's two sort of things uh, <laughs> that I can think about that, that would be like really sort of typical. <clears throat> so I want to cue the Sarah McLaughlin song. <clears throat> and I, what is that? ASPCA that uses the Sarah McLaughlin song, right? The Arms of the Angel. Uh, so what are they trying to do in that commercial? What do you think about that commercial? There's another commercial, it's a Michelin ad, and it's got a little baby on there. It's a cute little adorable baby. And I think they have like a car wreck and they say, because so much is riding on your tires, right? Uh, and so I want to make, make you think about what they're doing sort of there. What is their conclusion, right? And so what they're trying to do is, is they're trying to sort of manipulate you here, right? And they're trying to sort of manipulate you because we are emotional animals, right? Uh, humans are emotional animals. If anyone comes up to you and just tells you that they're logical, like they haven't studied logic. I don't know what to tell you, but like if you think you're logical, uh, <laughs> maybe try studying logic just for, for a few seconds and then you'll probably realize no. Uh, we are largely like emotional animals. And, the, and there's, not that there's anything wrong with emotion, but we should probably check our emotion with logic and make sure that we're actually following through to do things to, what I want to say, um, pursue that emotion in a healthy way, right? There's a healthy way to sort of pursue that emotion that's the logical form, and there's an unhealthy way to, to pursue that emotion, which doesn't actually help you meet your goals, right? It doesn't help you meet your goals of being a decent person. It actually helps you do the opposite, right? And so it's, it's important to sort of study this thing to be a decent person, right? I think a lot of like studying logic, there's, there's a, sometimes there's a like juxtaposition between being emotional and being logical, and uh, I personally don't see things that way. I personally see like you have to understand what you're doing logically to be a better person. And I can give you some multiple examples of that, but uh, <laughs> I think that might be coming from reading too much Russell, maybe. But <clears throat> let's talk about this back to the Sarah McLaughlin and Michelin ad. Uh, so if I think about the premises of, the, of those things, let's think about Sarah McLaughlin. And what are they saying? Therefore, you should donate to the SPCA. So you love puppies. The same The other one is you love, you love your kiddo, right? You love your child. So you love your kid, the babies. You gotta love them, babies. So you love babies. So what should you do? Maybe you should buy. Not asking for donations, but they're asking you to buy Michelin. So is it okay you love puppies? I hope you love puppies. I hope everyone loves puppies. <laughs> so you love puppies? Donate to the SPC. Does that follow from the premise? Because you love puppies, should you donate to the SPC? Yeah, maybe they're a good organization. That's not a bad one to donate to, but it doesn't necessarily follow that you should donate to this organization. There are other things you can do to help puppies out there. There may be other things you can do that would help puppies more than donating to the ASPCA. 
So there is a bit of a gap and a bit of a reach from going from you loving puppies to this is the necessary thing that you should do, right? It does not dictate that you should donate to the ASPCA. There are other things you can sort of do here. So the necessary conclusion would not be to donate to them, right? But they're trying to draw on your emotion. They're trying to draw on the fact that you love puppies. They're trying to show you all these sad pictures and the sad little Sarah McLaughlin song. Um, and they're trying to evoke a sort of emotional response. And when, when it's, it's a sort of manipulation tactic, to be honest, right? When you evoke these sort of emotional responses, it doesn't always like <laughs> trigger the most logical response in people, right? And so we really need to sort of check our emotion and, and see that we are actually pursuing something that is going to be beneficial to puppies, right? And I'm not trying to knock on the ASPCA. Go, do, go donate some money to them, fine. I, like, I have no problem with that. I, I, would, I would commend you for it, right? That's not what I'm trying to knock here. I'm just trying to say this is not a necessary conclusion. Maybe it's a little bit easier to say with the, with the Michelin, they're a company and they're obviously in it to capitalize on it. So if you love babies, if you love your child, you should buy Michelin, right? That probably seems a little more absurd, right? Uh, there are other tire companies you can buy. They're probably even safer. I think Michelin even had like some, some blowout problems not too long ago. So depending when you were talking about this, may not even be, have been the safest option, right? So it does not follow necessarily from that, right? <laughs> Please don't sue me, Michelin. I uh, know. Uh, <laughs> And a relevant person, okay, so blah. let me read things. So this is the seventh one. We're going to talk about personal attacks, ad hominem attacks. So ad hominem is like on the person. So this is instead of like discussing the point, you discuss the person, I guess is another way that they say it. That's uh, an irrelevant personal attack is used against instead of arguing the point, right? <laughs> okay. So my good example is Mayor McSleazy claims to have a tax plan that will reduce taxes for the middle class, but he isn't even honest with his wife. So, so the mayor has his tax plan. unfaithful politician so <laughs> mayor has a tax plan and it sounds like it may be like a beneficial tax plan from this person's perspective right okay so mayor has a tax plan but he's unfaithful right and so the premise or the conclusion maybe the conclusion is not even out right here right what is, what is being concluded about this mayor and his tax plan? It's being concluded that it's no good, right? And so the, the mayor has a tax plan that is no good. And why is it no good? Because he's unfaithful with his wife. So like the bill that he's proposing is being said to be not fit because of his personal relationships, right? Um, and so what's the problem here? Well, he may have like proposed something that was good, but maybe he's just like <laughs> not faithful, right? The one, one does not necessarily lead to the other. This may be a, a, a like, <laughs> don't, don't get me wrong. This is definitely probably a dent on his like character and, and the way that he operates things in his, uh, what was they like, Um, on probably how the public perceives his trustworthiness, it probably uh, impacts that. But it doesn't directly mean that this tax plan is no good, right? It's one of those things, even some, <laughs> it is, sometimes the broke clock is right, right? Uh, even some of the worst people will say the correct thing every once in a while, right? 
And a lot of times lies are kind of based on a little grain of truth and then they'll like kind of drag them out too, right? So that's also something, something that happens. Uh, um, we want to get to circular reasoning. We want to get to circular reasoning because of circular reasoning. Okay, so that's kind of horrible, but both premise and conclusion state the same thing. And I just like want to make it clear probably another time whether or not I support what's being said is, is, is kind of irrelevant. Uh, but here it is. Society has an obligation to provide education because education is a right of citizenship. So. And again, whether I support this or not, right? I think there's there's something to be said when it, when you look at like something that is a fallacy. So this says society has an obligation for education because education is a right. right? So because of this would would indicate that this is your premises. This is why you're concluding society has an obligation. So you could say this is your conclusion, this is your premises. But if we look at them, they're really saying this one and the same thing. And I think it's important to stray away from fallacies, especially especially if you believe in this, right? Because you want to be able to communicate your point to other people. And if you believe society has an obligation for education, you shouldn't base that on saying exactly the same thing. Education is a right, right? Saying society has an obligation is kind of one and the same as saying it's a right. Um, And so you want to say something maybe a little different and, and provide like substantive reasoning for that, right? This sounds a little redundant. Okay. So diversion, so this would be like a red herring if we want to divert attention from the real issue by focusing on another issue. <laughs> okay, so there is a sort of like famous example uh, for this one that I have in my notes. So your honor, my client may have killed those men, but if you consider the fact that his steady diet of Twinkies and Big Macs caused his blood pressure to rise, which led to mental anguish, limited mental capacitance, and a food coma induced rage, then there is... It's not too far of a stretch to suggest that my client was actually the victim of greedy, money-hungry, fast food, and junk food producers. And so this was like the fast food defense, right? I believe someone was getting charged with the, uh, capital murder uh, <clears throat> charges, and <laughs> this was the route that his lawyers took. Something along the lines of this, like... And so the premise of this Premises that fast food is bad, right? And then like the, the, the conclusion that they're drawing is their client murdered due to fast food, right? And so I'm hoping you realize why this is absurd, but this is sort of like going on a tangent. Like a lot of people eat fast food. Like there are some, maybe some substantive studies to maybe linking it to more aggressive behavior or something. I don't know. But for the most part, I don't think fast food is going and causing people to go murder people. There are a lot better uh reasons why we could like <laughs> motives or whatever that we could probably put to that uh, that are not fast food and then that would make more sense um and so this is a there was sort of red herring we would just create a sort of diversion from what is actually happening right 
and try to sort of blame something else. The last one we're going to talk about today is a straw man argument. So this is an argument based on distortion of person's rules, belief, words, or beliefs. So instead of arguing the point that someone is making, you try to argue something else that they are not saying. So like, I have a person. Person A says something like, maybe we should reform the prison system. And then person B says, oh, you think we should just allow everyone that's violent and dangerous criminal to ro roam the streets, right? Okay. And so let's, let's talk a little bit about this. Like why is this? So the conclusion that they're making is that this person is saying that dangerous criminals, they want dangerous criminals on the street. And they're saying that based on the premise that they want to reform prison, right? So the premise is okay. And so remember again, these are fallacies. These are false conclusions. These are not things you want to do. Um, and so why is this not true? Because you can reform prison without letting out like dangerous criminals. Um, there's a lot of non-dangerous criminals that get charged with a lot of things like drug uh, charges and stuff that aren't uh, violent. Um, and so there's a lot of things we could do to reform our prison. Uh, America's prison system is probably one of the, like, well, we imprison more people than any other country, right? And so we definitely, definitely, um, I want to say controversial sort of history happening there. Um, and so again, like this might seem really tempting, right? If you're against prison reform, it might seem really tempting to jump to this sort of conclusion. Because if we're thinking about this, like, it is easier to argue against dangerous criminals being on the street than it is to argue against reforming prisons when they obviously need them, right? Um, and so that's the last fallacy that we have. So in order to talk about, we, we, blah, blah, blah. we first we talked about things that weren't true, right? We want to talk, get those out of the way, things, common errors that people make. And so now we're getting to things like how do you uh, judge credibility and things of that nature. So one of the things is consider the source. Are you getting it from like National Enquirer or like Alex Jones or something silly like that? Or what, what sort of credibility is the source? Is it an org website? What sort of organization is it? Is it a political org? <laughs> Those things also make a difference too. Um, is it a government website? Is it a, what do I want to say? An educational website is it coming from a college itself and it's like their research um, also is it scholastic research you know is it <laughs> does it have credibility right check the date is it relevant is it outdated <laughs> um, make sure you're not quoting something from 1800 scientific literature that's you know been proven to be <laughs> Pseudoscience since then, there's that word pseudoscience, which is kind of a misnomer because it's not science, right? Uh, validate accuracy, other sources. So this is another thing and within science, this is what we like to do, right? We like repeated results. And so if you see something and you see something from one source, you can usually Google it, try to find multiple sources that say the same thing, right? Uh, try to look, at their phrasing, how their phrasing is. Make sure you're not interpreting things into the phrasing that aren't there, right? That's another thing that we do. We're all biased and we all put our biases into things. Uh, watch for hidden agendas. So again, like I said, like everything is biased, right? I don't think that there's anything that's not biased. It's just considering what the bias is and what I think there are more appropriate biases than other biases. Um, and so a lot of people say they're bias free 
And my personal take on that is that they don't actually understand what a bias is because we all have biases. Uh, if you want to read more about that, I would say probably like Howard Zinn makes a really, really good point in like chapter one, I believe it's chapter one of the people's history where he talks about different perspectives, the different perspectives people might have of Columbus um, and basically how they would both be factually correct, but they are very differing accounts, right? And based on your bias and what you put your, well, what would I say, priorities into, right? What, what you put your, uh, I want to say morals, but it's, it's like your, uh, what you find to be important, right? That in itself creates a sort of bias, right? <clears throat> and that's kind of what the point he makes is. Uh, <sighs> watching fairly and objectively or agenda driven. But with that said, there are things that are more sort of agenda driven than other things. There are things that are like more pure propaganda machines. They actually don't care for having factual information as much as they care about, you know, getting their agenda across. And uh, hopefully it's pretty apparent without saying the names. Uh, don't miss the picture, the big picture. Does it fit in with other things you know about the world or are they saying something that is completely contradictory? With that said, if people are providing you good evidence, eh, you know, be open-minded to good evidence as well, right? I believe in that. But also does it fit in with everything else you know, right? Or are they saying something that contradicts everything? Okay, so there's a few things. I just like copied and pasted this out of the book. But here's a few sources. I've had enough people tell me these aren't reliable or something. I'm just like, here you go. It's in the book. Uh, <laughs> if you want political fact check, politifact, factcheck.org. And like I said, like I do believe like these things still have their biases, but they are like fact checking and telling you pretty well whether these people are telling you accurate statements right i would have to say for the most part i would agree uh with it but maybe the who they focus on how much they focus on i don't know uh so i think that probably will end this first uh, chapter and so be sure to check out 1B, and I will see y'all in class.